uh, I'm, I'm thankful for the common faith that we have in Jesus Christ. And um, to address you all, to be a part of this movement is a great joy to me. Thank you for the privilege of being here. Now, we began defining the biblical gospel. And now we just finished defining a biblical church. Only now are we in a position to talk about biblical church leadership. Because fundamental to that is the gospel and the nature of the church itself. So as we approach that, let's ask the Lord for help. Let's pray. Father, now we ask that you would strengthen and sustain us. We pray, Lord, that you would awaken us and help us in this time to think about what it means to shepherd and serve your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastors spend time reading books and listening to podcasts and attending seminars like this and talking to one another about how to grow their churches because we want our churches to grow. We want them to grow numerically. We want them to grow measurably. Growth is a good thing. We don't want to shrink our churches. The problem is this. The problem is when you begin to adopt pragmatic approaches to engineering the growth, you know, a silver bullet technique, updating the ministry wardrobe, so to speak. If the fish are not biting, try some different bait, adopt new practices. So at pastor's workshops like these, too often it can descend into merely practical advice like, well, the number one rule of church growth is that your church will never grow larger than the parking lot. Or, here's another piece of advice. I encourage you to use plants, trees, and greenery as decorations in your facilities. Plants say at least something is alive in this place. <laughs> That's from a book I don't recommend. Rick Warren's <laughs> Purpose Driven Church. And everything in these workshops must be positive and upbeat. And by all means, you must make people feel comfortable in your churches. We want them to keep coming back, which is why Newsweek magazine reported the least demanding churches are now in greatest demand. Friends, I think underlying this quest for the latest silver bullet, the latest ministry fad, is a lack of confidence in what the Bible actually says about the church and about pastoral ministry. Now, people, and I mean evangelical people, good-hearted folk who, with whom we would have much partnership, tend to think that the Bible does speak to salvation and the Bible certainly does address the Christian life. But on questions related to how we do church, it's largely silent. There's not much there about the church. And so we're free to make it up as we go along. Whatever works, whatever culture dictates, we can do. But has God been silent on how his churches should be structured and led? Well, to consider that, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Please turn with me and keep your Bible open there. And look at verse 14. 1 Timothy 3, verse 14. Paul speaking to Timothy, his protege. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So there is guidance in the New Testament on how we do church, how we organize ourselves, how we lead congregations. This is why Paul wrote the letter to Timothy, so that if Paul was delayed, Timothy and the congregation at Ephesus would know how they ought to behave, how they ought to do church when they get together, 
week after week. They should, for example, thinking of the whole of 1 Timothy, they should pray for kings and those in authority over them. Chapter 2, verse 1. Men should stop quarreling and devote themselves to prayer with holy hands. Women, chapter 2, women should dress modestly. They should learn in full submission. And who should lead? Who should serve the churches? Well, we move into chapter 3 and we see that there are two offices described, elders and deacons. Elders and deacons. Those are the two points of my message this morning. First, consider elders, chapter 3, verse 1. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach. Now pause there. I'm reading the character qualifications of an elder. You might be tempted for your mind to wander while I'm reading this. But my friend, if you are a shepherd of God's people, if you aspire to the office of elder one day, your mind should be riveted on this. And even as we read this, we should be thinking in terms of meditation, examination of yourself. Not a drunkard, verse 3. Not violent, but gentle. Not quarrelsome. Not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So here are the non-negotiables. Here are the character qualifications of what Paul calls an overseer. I know he doesn't use the word pastor here. He doesn't use the word elder, does he? But as we look elsewhere in the New Testament, we see these words used interchangeably. In the following way, an elder is a pastor, is an overseer. Those three descriptive words explain the office of leadership in a local church. So in Acts chapter 20, we'll see this later, Paul goes to speak to the elders of Ephesus, and do you know what he says to them? He says to them, God has made you overseers. So he's addressing the elders. God has made them overseers. Or in 1 Peter chapter 5, he's addressing the elders, and he says, shepherd the flock of God, pastor the flock of God. So also look at Titus chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. These words are used interchangeably. Now, my church in Dubai, the Evangelical Christian Church of Dubai, is led by 10 overseers or elders or pastors. Those words are synonymous. Four of us on the elder team are paid full-time by the church, and the other six are employed with outside jobs in construction or finance or banking or what have you. Now, don't think in corporate terms about this. I think many people tend to think, well, there's the senior pastor, he's the CEO of the corporation, and the associate pastors, of which we have three, they're like the vice presidents. And think of the members as loyal customers. And what about the elders? What are they? Maybe they're the outside board of directors. Their job, so the thinking goes, is to hire the pastor to do the work of ministry. And so pastors minister and elders direct. The problem is that's not what we see in the New Testament. Scripture gives us, as we heard earlier, a plurality of pastoral leadership. Not just one. More than one. And notice, it's a good thing for you, my brother, 
to aspire to this office. Look at verse 1 again. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Now, some guys want to be overseers, but they're not qualified. Other people are qualified, but they don't want to do the work. Paul highlights that this is a noble task. There's such a thing as godly ambition, shepherding God's people. And let me tell you, being an overseer of a real life church is the most challenging thing and also the most rewarding thing that you can ever possibly do. These verses today show us what mature Christian leadership looks like in real life. So let me just pause right now and ask you, do you aspire to shepherd God's people? If you do not aspire to shepherd God's people, why not? What are you, what are you communicating to your church if you're happy to serve and lead, maybe teach occasionally, but you're unwilling to take on the burden of oversight? Or, if you do have this desire, but you're not yet recognized by a congregation as an elder, let me ask you this. Are you already shepherding members of the church, even though you're not recognized for doing such? Are you meeting up with other men, for example, and investing in them intentionally for their own spiritual good? You know, as we look out over our congregations, those of us who are elders know the most important thing we do, aside from the preaching and teaching of the word, is raising up the next generation of elders. I want to devote myself to raising up the team of people who will replace me when I leave. Because I'm keenly aware of the fact that I'm only a short-term steward of my responsibility as shepherd of the flock there in Dubai. The Bidian Yabwile says, you want to find men who are eager to watch over their fellow brethren and are happy to do so without recognition. Those who naturally and quietly go about the work of loving God's people are ideal for this noble task. And brothers, it all begins with the minister's self-watch. The self-watch of the minister. Before you presume to watch over somebody else's soul, you should watch over your own. That's what these verses are. These verses are criteria for self-evaluation. So in your own life and ministry, you should regularly go back to these and pray each one of these characteristics into your life. Repent of your inadequacy. Ask the Lord to strengthen you by his spirit. That's more important, incidentally, than how talented you are. Or how knowledgeable you are, even. You know, the Scottish minister, Robert Murray McShane, 19th century minister, he died at the age of 29. Great example for us. He wrote those diaries, the diaries of Robert Murray McShane. He said, it is not great talents God blesses so much as likeness to Jesus. A holy minister is an awesome weapon in the hand of God. So pour out your energy in conforming yourself to Christ and see what happens. So verse 2 begins, the overseer must be above reproach. Now, this is an um umbrella that encompasses all of the other criteria that follow. It basically means free from conspicuous sin. No obvious inconsistency. So if someone found out that you were harboring a hidden uh, secret sin, they would be surprised because of what they know of you. Because of God's grace in your life, no one would suspect you of scandalous sin. You are above reproach. We know that doesn't mean morally perfect. It means no one would suspect you of scandalous sin. Your life actually commends the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we'll see, Paul's main concern here in this paragraph is evangelistic. It's very interesting. His concern is that the leaders of this church actually commend the gospel to the outside world. In verse 7, he will return to the requirement that these leaders be well thought of by outsiders, by non-Christians. 
For example, are they faithful husbands? Verse 2. That's what it means to be husband of but one wife. Or literally, a one-woman man. Is he sexually trustworthy? Does he flirt around with people of the opposite sex? Does he engage women emotionally in inappropriate ways? Does he view pornography? How does he treat his wife? Is he a pastor, first and foremost, to her? What would she say if she were asked, does your husband have the qualifications of an elder? None of, the, none of this means that a, an elder must be married. Uh, we know the Apostle Paul himself was not married. He, he's just addressing the common expectation of that society. Elsewhere, Paul speaks of singleness as a charismatic gift. And he also speaks of the married state as a charismatic gift. Paul is concerned with harmony in marriage. He's concerned about a long-term track record of faithfulness vis-a-vis -vis your wife. And also, your children. The same goes for parenting. Verse 4. Look down at verse 4. He must manage his own household well, with all di dignity, keeping his children submissive. Now, why is that important for shepherding God's people? Look at verse 5. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So, the training ground for elders is the home. It's how your children regard you and speak of you and behave in your presence. Do they treat you with appropriate respect and obedience? All of us as elders, by the way, we tremble at this one because not only are we aware of our own weaknesses and corruptions, but we even begin to see them replicated in our own kids. And we know that our kids are sinners. And of course, Paul knew that too. He understood that, you know, the human heart is wayward. What he's talking about here is children who are wild and disobedient. In that case, the man is not qualified for office. He must have an orderly life within the home and also outside of it. So look at verse 2. He must be... Verse 2, middle of the verse, he must be sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable. So does he have control of his passions? Are his appetites balanced? Whether it's Cinnabon or Jalebi? Is that how you pronounce it? whether it's shawarma or whether it's anger or spending or drinking alcohol, men who are addicted to these things are not suited to pastoral office. So verse 3, must not be a drunkard, not violent but gentle. Does the man ever hit his wife? Does he rough her up in any way? Is he violent toward his children? Is he prone to spasms of violence or what Paul calls fits of rage? If so, not only is he not qualified to be an elder, he may not even be a Christian. He may simply be self-deceived, deluded that he's okay with God when in fact his life is marked by violence. Or here's another one that I think is very relevant for people like us in this room. Is he quarrelsome? This one is not uncommon among men. And it's not uncommon among people who are theologically motivated. There is an argumentativeness that characterizes some men, sometimes particularly younger men. A lack of proportion, a lack of balance. So the question is, is everything a hill to die on. You know that, that phrase. Is every contested issue worthy of splitting the church over, for example? Young men 
often see truths very clearly with 20-20 acuity, but they have no depth perception. They have no ability to distinguish between a central primary doctrine or an important but secondary doctrine or one that is tertiary and less important. Everything revealed in Scripture is important because God has spoken. That doesn't mean everything's a primary issue. You know, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, what I received from the Lord I handed on to you as a matter of first importance. That means there are matters of second importance. Ask yourself this, is COVID health policy really important enough to split your church over? Whether or not you wear masks, whether you get vaccinated or not, must pastors be public health experts now? Friends, aren't there more important things going on in Hyderabad or the, the city or village where you live than disputes over public health policy that consume people on Twitter and Facebook? Social media and the pandemic have highlighted people who are rigid and divisive and quarrelsome. They have become very popular. They have gained many followers. But a pastor, on the other hand, is called to be gentle and patient. Let's turn ahead to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse 23. Chapter 2, verse 23 of 2 Timothy. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents, notice this, with gentleness. Is that what you're seeing on the internet? And then, of course, there's the love of money. You know, a follower of Christ who loves money is showing, at root, a discontentedness, a worldly-mindedness that is unsuitable for an overseer of God's people. If he's controlled by money, he's not controlled by the Holy Spirit. Well, there's an overall maturity that is to be expected in a Christian leader. Verse 6. 1 Timothy 3, verse 6. He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Every once in a while, we hear about celebrities who get converted. And praise God for that. Yeah, I think there's some evidence that Justin Bieber has been saved. Or, you don't know these guys, but Neon Dion Sanders great American football player who played for, unfortunately, the Dallas Cowboys. Well, he became a believer, and people wanted to thrust these guys immediately into the limelight. Newbies in the faith can easily be puffed up with pride and expose themselves to the same judgment as the devil. You know, we see this in, in Dubai, in Arabia. What we sometimes see is a Muslim who comes to faith in Christ. He's a Muslim background believer, and he's often put on the pedestal as someone special because he comes from the other religious background. The worst thing you can do, and this would apply to you all as well, or Hindu background believers, don't put these guys on the pedestal. Don't make them think that they're anything special because, in fact, they're not. Rather, let them serve in humble positions, lest you harm them. So if you are a new believer... Don't seek after elder authority immediately. Rather, sink your roots deep into the Bible, deep into the church. Seek out a mature man in the church to guide you, to exemplify the Christian faith. Paul's concern in all of these qualifications is outward. He's concerned about the reputation of the church. Well, this is why a pastor 
needs to surround himself with godly mature men who will speak truth into his life. I know I want that. I know my own heart. My heart is prone to wander. But what we see here in chapter 3 is who the elder should be. He should be faithful. He should be temperate. He should be gentle, self-controlled. This is just basic Christianity 101. What's remarkable, remarkable about these qualifications is how unremarkable they are. All of these are to be expected of all Christians, but they are prerequisites for the office of elder or overseer. When a church appoints an overseer, that church is saying to the world, here is an official church-recognized example of Christian maturity. Insofar as he follows Christ, we will follow him. An elder's being gives credibility to his doing. McShane confessed, my people's greatest need is my personal holiness. So, brothers, understand this. Church leadership is not about managing a project. It is not about serving on a corporate board. No, the overseer is shepherding by simply being. That is, by virtue of the quality of his example. And so Paul emphasized to elders, keep watch over yourselves. So we've seen who the overseer is. He must be an example to the flock. I just want to touch on one thing that he does. I'm going to speak a little more on this later today, Lord willing. But look at verse 2. Look at the end of the verse. Chapter 3, verse 2. He must be able to teach. Incidentally, this is what distinguishes the office of elder from the office of deacon. See the deacon qualifications in verses 8 through 13. The lists are actually quite similar when you read them. In fact, you wonder, why did Paul even duplicate that paragraph? But since an overseer is a spiritual authority, he must be gifted to unfold the Word of God. An elder with no Bible is an elder with no authority. You know, my authority as an elder of my church in Dubai does not derive from anything in me inherently. It is only insofar as I minister the word faithfully and accurately that I am regarded as an authority in the church there. This, incidentally, is why the office of elder is restricted to men. This is why women, for all of their giftings, for all of their contribution in the lives of our churches, cannot be pastors. Look up at chapter 2, verse 11. I don't know how much of a live issue this is for you. If I were in the West, I would need to devote substantial energy to this subject because this is extremely controversial. That it says, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. And then look at verse 12. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Teaching and authority are the very thing that distinctively mark the office of elder. I mean, that's what distinguishes an elder from a deacon. This is not because the women are less capable than the men. It is not because women are less educated than men. These are unfair distortions of the biblical. The reason is that men and women while equal in dignity and in value, nonetheless, exercise different roles in the church and in the home. For example, in the home, uh, the husband is head of the wife. And in the church, the office of elder is restricted, not to all men, but to the subset of qualified men. Sometimes women, they're, they're offended, they can't, they can't be elders. And I sometimes respond to them, well, the majority of our men can't be elders either. And we're talking about a subset of qualified men. The rule here is that the teaching office 
in a local church is reserved to men. I mean the authoritative proclamation of the gospel in the gathered assembly. The big question is why? Is this because the women at Ephesus didn't have the opportunity to have sufficient education and so they were susceptible to false doctrines? Or is this a situation where Paul's instruction is simply culture bound and in our day and age as women occupy different roles in the society it's simply out of step kind of like greet one another with a holy kiss you know it's a, a cultural expression does Paul give us a reason why women are not to teach or exercise authority actually he does and it's in verse 13 look at verse 13 for Adam was formed first then Eve the reason is not unequal education it is not a feminist heresy in Ephesus that had to be snuffed out it is not culture at all its creation the reason is theological Adam was formed first and then Eve Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit sees significance in the order of authority that the man was formed first and therefore is to exercise godly and Christ-like authority over the wife or the congregation. Men are called to exercise pastoral leadership in the church just as they are in the home. It's not because women are inherently more gullible than men. It's not because they're intellectually inferior. Just get to know Rangini. Get to know my wife. If that were the case, that women are inherently unreliable, then why would Paul say in Titus 2 that women should teach other women? No. Paul is simply preserving biblical roles in the church and in the home rooted in creation. So, in looking for teachers in the congregation, we first want to find men who are teachable. They need to show the humility they need to have the lives that are known in the church. They need to be people who agree with our statement of faith, including especially the controversial rough edges. And since not all teaching is public, we need to see people who are already exercising those gifts in one-to-one -one discipling relationships or counseling or other people growing under the influence of his ministry. His counseling needs to be sound and biblical. So ask yourself, do you have the qualifications to be an elder in God's church? Have you examined yourself recently in light of this? Are you praying that you would? If you do, brothers, take heed to yourself. Become a student of Scripture more and more. Begin meeting up with others in the congregation for your own spiritual improvement. And encouragement attend prayer meetings be devoted to the members meetings of the congregation serve the congregation where it's needed ask yourself this question how would it be if every member in the church treated the church like I do would the ministry surge forward dramatically or would it come to a screeching halt This is what the Bible teaches about the office of spiritual leader, elder, overseer, pastor. More briefly, I want to touch on the office of deacon. And it's interesting to see the differences between the paragraph above and the one below. Look at verse 8. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. 
I want to say that godly deacons caused the gospel to surge forward in extraordinary ways. Do you remember Acts chapter 6? In Acts chapter 6, some of the widows in the early church were being deprived of the daily distribution of food, and it was along ethnic lines. It was the Hebrew-speaking women who were being deprived, so there was a rift in the church. And what did the apostles do? Well, they told the church to select seven men, known to be full of the spirit and of wisdom, to handle the need, so then the apostles would carry on with the ministry of the word and prayer. And then what happened? Chapter 6, verse 7 says, So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests came, became obedient to the faith. So here we see the result of godly diaconal ministry. We see first, deacons serve practical needs in the congregation. That's what the word means, deacon, servant. In this case, deaconing tables. They helped with distribution of food in the early church. Deacons today in our churches serve to promote physical uh, needs and ministries like hospitality, finance, uh, benevolence, ordinances, coordinating specific ministries. Deacons build unity. You can think of a deacon, a good deacon is like a shock absorber. So in this case, there was a, a rift, an argument in the church between the widows. And the deacons came in and they resolved the problem. And unity was preserved and the gospel advanced forward. They were the shock absorbers of the church. And then the final thing we see here is that deacons ultimately serve the gospel. We saw the result of this diaconal work was the gospel powered forward. Deacons enabled it to happen. So don't think of the deacon as a technocrat with special skills. No, he must be a mature believer. Verse 9. He must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. So a solid grasp of the gospel, adhering wholeheartedly to the statement of faith. Notice one difference here between deacons and elders. It says deacons must hold to the truths of the faith but not necessarily be able to teach them. The diaconal office is not a teaching office. Therefore, it doesn't come with that level of authority. Elders lead ministry. Deacons facilitate the ministry. And the members of a congregation, well, they do the ministry. Which is why, according to the Bible, I would argue, and I might get myself in trouble here, I would argue that deacons can be women. Now, I might be wrong on this, but look at verse 11. Verse 11, their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. I'm reading from the ESV. What's interesting, though, is literally it doesn't say their wives, it says the women or the wives. The possessive pronoun there is not there. That's an interpretation by the ESV translators. So you probably have a footnote in your Bible which gives an alternative translation like I do in mine in the same way women deacons are to be worthy of respect or just women must be worthy of respect. Grammatically it could go either way. The same Greek word means women or wives. So what's going on here I want to suggest this refers verse 11 is like a parenthesis referring to female deacons I'll give you two reasons why I believe that you know people need to justify their positions from what the Bible says number one in Romans chapter 16 Paul speaks of a woman named Phoebe and he says she was a deaconess of the church so it seems there were female deacons ministering in the churches but here's the second reason. 1 Timothy 3 says nothing about the wives of elders in the previous paragraph. That's very interesting. Why lay a requirement on deacons' wives and not on elders' wives? Especially if the elders are the ones who are the spiritual authorities of the church. Well, the answer is, I conclude it's not talking about the wives of deacons, but rather women who serve as deacons. 
So verse 11 as a parenthesis addressing the exceptional case of women serving one another as deacons. And then in verse 12, he goes back to the regular, the, uh, the general pattern. Verse 12, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a great standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Friends, that's the reason to pursue service in your church. Great confidence in Jesus Christ. Great re reward is coming. An excellent standing. So let me ask you, are you a deacon in your church? Are you devoted to serving the needs of God's people? Do you show up early and look for ways to assist? Or do you come late and let other people serve you? You know, in the economy of man, it's the guy on top who receives the service. But in the kingdom of God, it's flipped on its side. Jesus said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. Thank God for faithful deacons. They enable us to worship. They cause the gospel to power forward. They build unity. Brothers, it matters how we conduct ourselves in our churches. Because God lives among us. Verse 15 says the church is God's household. That is his family. Not a denomination. Not an ecclesiastical hierarchy or a building somewhere. A real live assembly of converted people. God lives among them. So when we sing, when we hear the word preached, when we observe baptism in the Lord's table, there he is among us. God is in the house. Maybe we could just worship at home. I mean, people got used to doing that during the pandemic. We could do church in the metaverse. I'm reading that more and more on the internet. Metaverse church. But I agree with Martin Luther, who said, at home in my own house, there is no warmth or vigor in me. But in the church, when the multitude is gathered together, a fire is kindled in my heart and it breaks its way through. Brothers, cyber church will not do. We need each other in regular assembly and all the more as the day approaches. So if you are a member of the family, then you must be present in the household. He calls his family the pillar and foundation of the truth. Those are architectural terms. It's as though we're, we're building up the truth, we're preserving it, displaying it, guarding it by our corporate lives together. Now the Ephesians would have understood that illusion very well because they lived in the shadow of the famed temple of the goddess Artemis in ancient Ephesus. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. More than 100 ionic columns, each of them over 18 meters high, and they held up this massive shining marble roof. It was an impressive but sad monument to a non-existent goddess, a hopelessly false idol that eventually crumbled only to be picked over by archaeologists centuries later. But those believers who were gathering in obscurity, in small assemblies, they were the temple of the living God. They supported the truth. They held it up through their service, just like those pillars that held up the mar marble roof of Artemis's temple. Friends, this is what we must do. We must hold up the roof of the gospel through our energetic commitment to God's people. The local church is God's evangelism plan, not any other agency, not any parachurch entity. The ordinary local assembly is ultimately what will promote and protect the truth. So. What are you doing to advance that cause? Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would help us to rightly esteem the bride of Christ, the pillar and buttress of truth. 
We pray, Lord, that you would help us to think biblically more than culturally about church leadership. We pray, Heavenly Father, regardless of our denominational background, regardless of what we grew up with, that you would shape our thoughts about leadership by what's actually in the New Testament. And as a result, we pray that congregations in this region of India would thrive through humble, Christ-like service for the sake of our King, in whose name we pray. Amen.